Hey guys, what's happening? So with us beginning our coverage on Absolute Batman, written by Scott Snyder, there's a lot of thoughts I gotta share on this. So we've got to cover Absolute Batman, Absolute Superman, Absolute Wonder Woman, Absolute Vodka, cause I really like what I'm seeing so far. So with that said, if you're enjoying these videos, be sure to drop a like, subscribe if you're new to the channel, and don't forget to hit that bell up top to get all notifications. All right, so this starts out with us seeing a very young Bruce from many years back on a school field trip to Gotham Zoo. And in this quick flashback, we see the young Bruce stop when he sees a sign talking about the bats that are on display, only for his teacher to call him and tell him there'll be plenty of time for bats later. But this brief introduction, which we'll learn more about as this story continues, but this brief introduction is just setting us up for what we'll find to be a very different backstory and upbringing for the younger Bruce Wayne. Then following this, we jump forward to the present day where we see a man on the motorcycle heading into Gotham. And as he does, we get this monologue from him where he says, Hello again, Gotham. It's been a long time. So who are you these days? Who have you become while I was gone? You're prettier, I'll give you that. Taller, brighter. But deep down, something's changed. My third lap around and I still can't find it. Where's your heart? You used to have a center, hot and beating, but something's hollowed you out. In fact, I barely recognize you anymore. I'm not sure I like this new you, Gotham, but that's okay. I don't think you're going to like me much either. My name is Alfred Pennyworth, and I'm here to do some bad things. And really, it sounds like the intro you hear before the opening credits, but it's really sick though, because when Alfred arrives, he stops by his favorite tea shop, he chains down his bike, and he heads over to his spot, which is practically next door to the shop. And when he goes inside, he's got a retinal scanner to go in, first of all. And when he opens up this huge metal door, there's guns everywhere, computers, and it's set up in a way where it leans heavily into Alfred having a military background, which is something we've talked about on the channel before as far as Alfred's past. Because I want to say in most stories, Alfred's been depicted with some level of military experience. Because for example, in a story called Friends Like These, written by Len Wein, we're told the story of how Alfred served in World War II, freeing refugees and inflicting a lot of pain, to where after when he came back, he returned to his true love, which was theater, which for the most part he fell in love with because his mother loved theater, but as for his father who served the Wayne family, it was his dying wish for Alfred to continue the domestic service that the Pennyworth family had provided for generations, which is what led to Alfred serving the Wayne family. And in addition to this, in Batman Annual number 13, in a story called Waiting in the Wings by Kevin Dooley, this took it a step further, where after 18 years of serving at Wayne Manor, when Bruce came back, Alfred was like, you know what, I'm going back to acting. Because again, the whole butler thing, that's what Alfred's father wanted. Because again, his mother, who was quote unquote, never a butler's wife, she ended up leaving his father because the stage was calling. Because from a young age, Alfred loved the theater too, and he preferred the supporting roles. But this all came together in this story when Bruce came back. Because Alfred had noticed from the time that Bruce's parents died when he was six, even up to Bruce's return, Bruce was as obsessed with his father's death as Alfred was with his father's life. And at the time, there was this emphasis on the good that one man could do, which before for Alfred was serving in the war and even playing those supporting roles in theater. But later on, he really found where he was needed most when Bruce went out on his first night as a vigilante, leaving a trail of blood and needing Alfred's army medical training to where fortunately for Bruce, they are the same blood type. But throughout this story with Alfred playing the supporting role in Bruce's life, Bruce called on Alfred's costuming skills to come up with something practical yet nightmarish. But I bring this up not only to point out what we've seen before as far as Alfred's military history, but also with this being a very different take on the story that we're given here from Scott Snyder, there's still a lot of things that translate through in this world, like Alfred's attention to detail, for example. And we'll talk more about those things as we make our way through. But as soon as Alfred gets here, he makes his tea and he calls his daughter Julia to let her know he's back in town. But she doesn't pick up, so he leaves a message. And you can tell right away, they don't have the best relationship, which is likely because of the type of work that Alfred does. Because from what we're shown, this Alfred's a mercenary. But the next thing we see here, just after he calls his daughter, Alfred signs into his secure connection to get the intel on the job he's been called back to Gotham for. Because just prior to this in Singapore, he was close to his target, who he spent five years closing in on just for them to pull him out. And so they end up telling him in the past three months, a gang known as the Party Animals has been sowing chaos, butchering citizens at random, raising the murder rate by 700%, almost single-handedly. A daycare was torched yesterday, 
They danced outside while 32 burned. But at this point, Alfred, he knows the details. So with him questioning why they pulled him from Singapore to come to Gotham, he's just told that he's needed here and that his assignment is strictly surveillance. Gather information on the party animals, but do not engage. And in addition to that, he's told there might be another player in town who they only caught glimpses of, who's been circling around the gang as well. And they tell Alfred if he gets close, Alfred has authorization to engage him. And we can tell by the distorted image that this other player is definitely Batman. And after this, the next place we head over to is Croc's gym. And the first thing we see when we go inside is this young guy with black hair in great shape, throwing all sorts of kicks and punches at this bag. And as he does, he's saying things like, tonight this is your city, no fear, no weakness. Tonight you are a, just before someone else approaches from behind saying, I think it's my turn. And that someone else is Bruce Wayne. And you can tell with how this is done, it's set up to make you think the first guy was Bruce, only for Bruce to be the refrigerator standing behind him, or at least that's what I thought. Because at first I was thinking like, okay, we're jumping forward in time here, only for the current day Bruce to step out looking like the Bruce Wayne that ate Bruce Wayne. And man, when he starts hitting this bag, he quickly turns into that guy at the gym who everybody turns around and looks at like, what the hell is he training so hard for? And I mean, we know, because he's Batman, but most people see something like this and they're like, dude, the average human being don't need all that. But while Bruce is just destroying this bag, we get another flashback here, which takes us back to the zoo, where we find out Bruce's father was also his teacher. And in this memory, Bruce remembers his father asking the class what they've learned today, as they all were looking at the lion, to where Bruce responded, that guy has the life. And at the time when his dad asked him to elaborate on what he meant, Bruce said, well, it says here he sleeps 20 hours. Plus, he gets fed prime rib three times a day and never has to be afraid of anything. And even as a student, he called his father Mr. Wayne. And as far as I'm aware, that's pretty normal when it comes to kids who have parents that are teachers at their school. But for a moment here, Bruce just remembers his father joking about the effectiveness of the lion. So Bruce jokes back. And after that, his dad asks him if he's excited for the movie tonight, which turns out to be the film that Thomas and Martha met at. And I imagine a lot of these elements that are kind of just brushed through in these glimpses, they're all gonna affect Bruce at some capacity later on. Because in the middle of this conversation, as their group continued through the zoo, shots rung out, implying that tragedy followed. As we see the present day, Bruce just KO this bag looking like a Street Fighter 6 DLC character. And so just after this, Waylon Jones comes over, cause this is his gym and he's good friends with Bruce, but Bruce gonna have to pay for that bag, which in all is like 120 bucks. So Bruce apologizes and he like, he'll get him the money when he gets paid. And it's kind of like, man, when's the last time you heard a Bruce Wayne say that <laughs> when he gets paid? But something even as small as that is just a reminder that this Bruce Wayne is not a billionaire, which in my opinion, it makes the Batman thing just even more special because this means he's working with the same time and opportunity that everybody else has. But while they're talking here, Waylon mentions that Ozzy hooked him up with an exotic pet license, which is alluding to an upcoming endeavor that both him and Ozzy are getting into, which immediately has Bruce like Ozzy's gonna get busted any day now. But as Bruce is leaving, Waylon tells him that penguins know how to hide their eggs and Ozzy's their boy, so why wouldn't he work with him? And right after that, Waylon tells him, you haven't come to poker in months, man. Everyone's in this week. Eddie, Harvey, Oz, and he's even trying to get Selena to come through. Only for Bruce to tell him that he can't before Waylon even gets the whole sentence out. And as Bruce walks out the door, Waylon goes on to mention the stuff that's been in the news about the party animals and how they're terrorizing Gotham, all the while Bruce is leaving because he said he had to go. And as Bruce leaves, Waylon of course is like, I'm talking to you. This is our home, man. Someone's got to do something. And it's crazy how just in this conversation, we're shown that all these guys grew up here together in Gotham. And I like this addition because I imagine it's only going to get crazier when we find out more, especially if any of them were in Bruce's class with him and his father. And following this, we head over to this huge yacht where the leader of the party animals is invited, the head of the Falcone and Moroni families, who at this point have been running Gotham for the past century and a half. And when they get here, they tell the leader of the party animals that they're aware of their Illuminati-like organization by way of the rumors that they've heard. Because they've heard about the party animals having goats here, giraffes there. So they're asking this guy questions about why all the killing in Gotham. Because at this time, it seems to have no reason to it. And at first, the leader of the party animals, he just has his DJ blasting the music. He's entertaining other conversations. And so Falcone and Moroni, they're like, what is this, a festival? Cut that music off, put that kid to bed, listen up. But essentially, Falcone and Moroni, they just tell the leader of the party animals that they've been running things here in Gotham. They've got rules, they have history here. So they're not gonna allow this guy to just come in and stir up all this chaos. So they tell him to take his little party boat and be gone by dawn. 
so the party animal leader just tells him, friends, I'm afraid you have me all wrong. History is what I'm all about. That's what we're celebrating here. It's end. So next he goes on to reveal to them these different masks, which include that of Socrates, Martin Luther, George Washington, and as he goes down the line, he just casually reveals Mr. Moroni's brother, followed by Mr. Falcone's cousin, where next to that is two empty spots made just for them. And after killing these guys, they just turn the music back up and get back to partying now that these two are part of the collection. And following this, with the news being just flooded with party animal attacks taking place all over Gotham, it's here we're told that tonight, Mayor Jim Gordon is holding an emergency town hall to discuss what to do about the party animals. And at the same time, we also see Bruce suiting up. And it's really sick how we just see the silhouette. It's like the calm before the storm. But first, when we head over to Town Hall, these people are giving Mayor Gordon a hard time because they're telling him how things were better when they had Mayor Hill because at least then they weren't getting killed off. But among the people here, we see Waylon from Crocs Gym who points out that Hamilton Hill is a crook. And that's where a couple others come in like maybe he's a crook, but at least he's tough. He'd fight back. And it's really just one of those things where it's like, it doesn't matter who's mayor right now because if Hill was still mayor and this was still happening, they'd be yelling at him. Then you have another guy here who says, I run a finger tellers on 27th street. Every single weekday for 71 years, I've walked to my shop, except the day my son was born and the day my wife died. 18,302 times I've walked there, but I don't walk there anymore. I don't walk anywhere because I'm scared. And it's crazy because this affects everyone on some level. And during this town hall, we see Alfred just outside with eyes on the party animals who are moving in. But when he radios his status, they tell him to report back after the incident. So he responds saying, mass casualties possible, sir. Permission to engage. Only for them to tell him permission denied Pennyworth. Whatever happens there, you observe only. So they're sticking to what they said earlier. Meanwhile, inside, things are getting worked up because Mayor Gordon, he tries to tell the people that he's working with the police around the clock. But this one guy just jumps up like police. The party animals torched the station two hours ago. So now it's like with the police being attacked, they know that the party animals aren't afraid of anyone. And I like how when this guy brings it up, we see Commissioner Bullock over to the side kind of like, is that so? Because it just makes me think of those cases where you have officers who are just ready to go after civilians instead of actual criminals. Because Commissioner Bullock is really giving off that vibe right now. But Mayor Gordon tells Bullock to take it easy just as Martha Wayne gets up to defend Mayor Gordon because she works with his office. She's known him for years and she vouches for him. But then it's right here where a flashbang comes crashing through the window as the party animals make their entrance. So right away, Mayor Gordon's telling them like, hey, up here, look at me, in hopes of keeping them from aiming at anyone in the crowd. So one of these dudes like, oh, hi, Jimmy. Then he's like, bye, Jimmy. And he just starts shooting shredding up the podium and though mayor gordon gets injured during this right away his daughter barbara comes to help him out which for a moment here just lets us know who and where barbara gordon is in the larger picture to where next one of these guys is just like anyone want to beg tell us about your kids your sick grandma we love that nope all right then rip them up but before they're able to open fire these guys get yeeted because they just go flying back through the door and it slams shut and there's more of these guys heading in dozens of them but for a moment here barbara goes to the door to see what happened but when she opens it batman's on the other side like whatever you hear you do not open this door and now that they're outside we see alfred who's watching from above as he's requested to give an update on the casualty count so he tells him there's none but the other players just arrived so after saying that, they tell Alfred if the other player disrupts intel gathering, he's to engage. And he takes a moment to respond, but he eventually tells them, copy. But then it's right here as Batman's hanging upside down from City Hall, where the party animals, they just open fire. And I mean, fortunately, his cape and cowl, is it's all bulletproof. So for a moment here, I'm like, woo, at least he could afford that. But following this, when he drops down to take care of these party animals, this dude gives a whole new meaning to animal cruelty because he just crushes the first guy. And the next two, he just tosses them, one through a window and the other one into a light post. And it's funny because one of them's like, wait, 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 because he saw the first two get it. But it's cool to see how this Batman uses his cape either to attack or defend or lift himself from the ground like some stilts. Like it's heavy duty and versatile for what I assume was an affordable price. But as more of these party animals make their way in, Alfred who's up above watching and quote unquote still gathering data, he makes some observations about the Batman. Because he says here, well, well, look at you go. Whoever you are, you got flair, I'll give you that. All right, big guy, let's see what you can really do. You're fast, steady, above all, focused. You've been waiting for this, haven't you? Yeah, you have. You're trained too. Mixed martial arts, your own blend. Muay Thai, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you're a striker above all. 
brutal yet precise. You're putting on a show, a leg stomped on so everyone hears the crack, an arm snapped over your knee, sending a message. And the knife work? My lord. So bloody, yet you miss each artery by just enough. No fatalities, not at all. Not one. And it causes Alfred to come to the conclusion like, okay, this guy's an idealist. But then it's here one of the party animals pulls out a meat cleaver. And this guy tells Batman, this hand has killed more people than you can count. Now I'm going to give you one chance to get the blank out of our way. And for me, I just love everything about the way that this Batman handles this. Because for starters, he takes the bat symbol off of his chest to use it as this huge bat axe. And when this party animal charges at him with one swing, Batman ends his hand's whole career. You know, the hand he was talking about that killed more people than Batman could count. And I mean, next he tells this guy, I hear they can reattach them sometimes. There's a hospital three blocks south of here. Or is it east? I can't seem to remember all of a sudden. Which is quite funny because this Batman, he knows Gotham very well. We'll talk about that. But then he looks at the rest of these guys and he tells them what the big man told him. Because he's like, the rest of you, I'm going to give you one chance to get the blank out of my way. And it's like, man, the way that he took their intimidation tactic and just pointed it right back at them, that was just brilliant. Because he's got to let them know that bats are crazy. So just after this, as Alfred is still watching, it's here where Alfred's like, well done. But if you were a true tactician, you'd have set up a trap for those fleeing the scene. But he doesn't even get to finish the sentence before absolute Batman detonates a bomb, causing the stairs to collapse, which makes the fleeing party animals go down the hole. And after this, when Alfred is given the instruction to engage this other player, he makes his way down to find Batman inspecting one of these party animal masks. So he creeps up behind him at point blank range. And as he prepares to shoot, Alfred tells him, that is the sound of a DC-34 automatic shotgun, son. There are only three of them in the world. It could blow your brains all over this sidewalk before you even blink. But Batman just kicks Alfred so hard and so fast that when he lets go of the shotgun, it just stays in midair and Batman just catches it. And he's just like, huh, sounds dangerous. So he takes Alfred's gun and he just leaves him there. And following this, we get more of Alfred's narration saying, the next day, everyone's talking about it. Who is the Batman? So who are you really? Bruce Wayne? You hide your tracks well, but it's easy when you're no one. Just some guy 24 years old, mom's a social worker, dad's a teacher. You grow up in crime alley, high friends in low places, a tight group. You're smart, excel in school, your parents have you tested and you score near genius level. Then in fifth grade, you win a student engineering competition, creating a mobile collapsible bridge that can be used to bring aid to locations hit by catastrophic damage. From war, cataclysm. The design is origami-like, based on the anatomy of a bat wing. And the prize is a trophy, a trip for your whole class to the Gotham Zoo, where it starts. Which I can only imagine for Bruce. He's likely feeling some level of guilt since he was the reason why his class and his father were at the Gotham Zoo when the incident happened. Because at this point, though we haven't been shown the incident in its entirety, for a moment here we see the current day Bruce leaving flowers at the site where his father passed, at Gotham Zoo. But we get glimpses of that moment where after shots let off, his father, Mr. Wayne, took all the kids and put them in the bat enclosure, which was the last time the young Bruce saw his father alive. And I gotta say, this new take on the tragic death in Bruce's childhood that set him on the path to become Batman. This has got a lot of potential, man, because for years we've seen so many stories spin out of the telling of both of Bruce's parents dying in Crime Alley. And a lot of good stories at that, with the Flashpoint universe being one of the first things that come to mind. And I mean, even in recent years with Joker War and Dark Knight's Metal and even Night Terrors, there were some really cool ideas that were spinning off of what happened in Crime Alley. And it just has me thinking if absolute Batman gets anywhere near that same treatment at any point in time as far as the size or scale of any of these examples there are just so many insane ways that you could take the concept of a zoo and flip that into something crazy without repeating what's been done time and time again or taking us into dark knight's metal 2.0 and i mean this is only going to be a five-part series but who knows what we might get later on but following this alfred goes on to say after that you lost yourself for a while lashed out raged at the world but then you find yourself again something inspires you you straighten out you go back to school and get a scholarship to the best university in the state but when you get there you're injured in the first week a soft tissue tear i've seen the x-rays though and i've been in command of men who faked injury to escape duty and i suspect that's exactly what you did but why you were good enough to be a star even go pro because you were saving your body for last night for all this whatever it is you've built you've studied applied mechanics 
chemistry, criminal psychology, military theory, sociocultural history, everything to prepare. And then you come home. You set up in Gotham and work the power grid. Then the water department. Next, sanitation. After that, you intern at City Hall, studying public policy, macro and micro, learning your city, the body, the brain, every damn part. Until finally you come full circle, ever the engineer, creating, building, you even fix what you break, repairing the stairs you blew up last night. You've built something here, Bruce. I see it now. And it's impressive, truly. But I've taken down men like you before in cities, in jungles, in deserts, all over the world, because you're crusaders. And crusaders always have a weakness, and yours is sitting right there. Because with Alfred following Bruce, he finds Bruce visiting his mother, who he saw earlier at town hall, getting her turn to speak just when the party animals barged in. With seeing Bruce here, Alfred knows that he could just kill him right here, right now. And he says for a moment here that it's what he should do. But at this point, when Alfred's daughter, Julia, finally replies, telling him never contact me again, Alfred lets Bruce go while thinking about how he's just a kid. And after this, next we head over to Bruce's hideout, which is quite the opposite of the Batcave, with him using the empty top floors of these buildings that he worked on in the past that are just considered to be hollow investments that he knows no one's coming up here to check on, at least not until now, because at this point Alfred's tracked Bruce down here. And this is one of the reasons why when I brought up Alfred earlier and how in the main DC universe, he had figured out so much about Bruce and the things that would come together for him to become Batman. Because this time around, it's almost like we're seeing a version of that in reverse with this version of Alfred finding Batman and picking everything apart to discover Bruce. And I think it's really cool how that played out. But this Alfred, he's got more to learn because when he moves in, he sees Batman holding the shotgun he took from him. And it's funny because when Alfred sees Batman with the shotgun, he's like, oh, so you get backed into a corner and all them ideals go out the window, huh? But the only thing he hears after that is that chick chack. But right here, Alfred's just like, give me the gun, kid. You're no killer. Only for Bruce to squeeze the trigger and deliver a headshot that Alfred did not see coming. Because as it turns out, Bruce modified the gun so it's non-lethal, which then has Alfred going on to say the kid ruined it. But the next thing Alfred hears is the sound of Batman tossing the gun back to Alfred and telling him to keep it to where finally he hears the roar of his own bike because Batman stole his bike just moments after Alfred made his way to Gotham, which means Batman was following Alfred before he even knew who Batman was. And it's a crazy twist because the whole time that Alfred thought he was making these astute observations, Batman had been peeped this guy out, watching him on that bike riding laps around Gotham, looking for its heart as absolute Batman rides off the building with Alfred's bike into the night. To where from here, the next thing we do is head into the epilogue, where Alfred, who's all patched up now, is speaking with his contact and letting him know that the other player got away and he'll get him next time if he interferes. But they go on to tell him to just stay focused on the party animals. And for what it's worth, they lost his old target somewhere in the Philippines, which is very frustrating for Alfred because he was tracking the guy for five years the guy studied with Henry Descartes in France and then killed him. He trained with the League of Assassins and then killed them. Only for Alfred to get so close, get pulled away, and now dude's in the wind. But at a semiconductor manufacturing plant in Manila, we see two helicopter pilots preparing for takeoff. And one of the pilots is asking about the guy they're picking up. Because he's like, so it's just sir, nothing else, no mister, this or that. Only for the other pilot to tell him, nope, they're all fake anyway. Jack, Arthur, and he's like, I don't even know his real name. As he goes on to say, when you're one of the 30 richest men on the planet, you can be whoever you want, I guess. So the other guy's like, you think he'd want to be my rich, generous best friend? Only for the other pilot to say, don't do that. Don't joke. Didn't you hear? The guy never laughs, not at anything, ever. That's why they call him the Joker. And you can just tell he is going to be a serious problem. And so now real quick, I want to give a special shout out to all the patrons. Thank you guys for all of your support. And for anyone who's new here who wants more information on how to support the channel, I got a link below where you can go to patreon.com slash dopespill. But that'll do it for this one, guys. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below, and we'll do it again on the next one. All right, later.